when I was in eighth grade, I was like, I want to make videos. I want to make short films. And then I sort of just pursued that. What I really like about film and video is that it's an audio visual art form. I just like to mix things together. I like to think of myself as like a collage artist. I just think it's really cool that we are able to use technology to like capture stories. You know, you got to take control of the media. Is that your <laughs> East slogan? <laughs>
do you find yourself, do you refer to yourself as like a specific title? Like, for example, I say I'm a documentary filmmaker and then I throw in media producer because I do some other things too. But I think with any label, labels can be restricting. So I was just curious if you yeah. like, when you're describing yourself and what you do to other people, what do you, what do you say? That's a very interesting question. Um, I think it it also just kind of changes as well. In general, I'm at the point in like my career slash like my art life where I'm like constantly trying to redefine myself and like figure out what I'm doing. But I think first off now I like introduce myself as a digital media educator because this is what I spend most of my time doing. And I really value the work that I do here at Metro. So that's sort of what I put at the forefront. But I also, um, I say I'm like a videographer slash filmmaker slash photographer slash, I guess just media maker. I like that term as like something more broad. Yeah. And I think even people who may have traditionally defined themselves as filmmakers or artists now because just of the way social media works, our online landscape, everything is so cross-disciplinary. So yeah, there definitely is a fluidity there. So you mentioned like the digital media educator, like that being your position at Metro East. Um, This taking it in a spin, but I was thinking like, is there a favorite memory that you've had during your time in this position in the last Mm -hmm. year? So that could be anything. Whether that's like related to a class or something you worked on. Yeah. Um, I am really lucky that I like get to work a job that I enjoy. (laughs) Um, Because when you, I don't have like just one favorite memory. I feel like I have so many. So just like little things that come into my mind is when we did the, I think it was the Play East camp. There was a student there who was a lot younger than the rest and was nonverbal. And he like, I was trying to help him take pictures on the iPad. And then he took a picture of me, which I thought was super sweet because he was so small and I was like taller than him. It was just like a cute little moment like that, like interacting with the kids. Or most recently we did a spring break camp at Rockwood CDC and uh, the kids were able to like make their own videos and sketches. And that was a lot of fun just because like their imagination coming to life is really good to see. And also it's just like they're funny, you know, they're having fun and watching them do their own thing. It makes me happy because you can tell that they're actually enjoying the time that we spend with them. So that I think for me is really valuable because I kind of need to feed off of that in order to feel like what I'm doing is, I guess, like creating an impact you know, because um, going out and like teaching classes, I feel like the concept of itself is so like intimidating to me. But once I'm actually there and like I'm interacting with people and kind of seeing uh, seeing people's like personalities come out, that's what like I really value. So. Yeah, I think what's cool about the position and, you know, I do similar work with Jasmine is that you know, we have our own creative backgrounds, but then Mm -hmm. going into, we do a wide range of educational programming, but some of it is with, we partner with local organizations, we do spring break camps, summer camps, and, and often serving youth who can be, we've had people as young as two who show up. Yeah. Yeah. Like two, and they're more there with their siblings, two to 13 generally. Mm -hmm. And we're teaching very like introductory level courses. Here's how to film with accessible equipment, the iPad, but you can see it's almost an extension of our own creativity. You're you're then mentoring, guiding other creators. And I think like for me the cool thing about working with kids is they're so like unimpeded, like they just let whatever they want to flow out of them totally. like they don't I don't, they're just so expressive like they're like oh I have this idea boom done versus yeah. like us or at least me as a creator I'm like oh I don't know if I want to do that blah, blah, blah. there's none of that they're just fun so I think yeah. that's awesome in terms of your journey as a filmmaker uh, or as an artist or what, what do you say a media producer uh, media, media maker? maker I don't know yeah <laughs> as a media maker 
let's take it back to maybe when you were that age. So this is mm-hmm. before, this is the Jasmine before the one year or the eight <laughs> months that I've taken it real back. What were your first experiences with media? Well, if we're taking it all the way back, my first interaction with media started with YouTube. And at the time, I think I was really into like these British YouTubers and they were fairly young. So I think I was like 12 and they were maybe like 15, 16 or something. And it seemed like making videos or making short films was something that I could pursue. And so by the time I was like 13 or 14, we were ending eighth grade. And I was felt like very emotional about it because I was like, my childhood is over. I'm going to be a high schooler now. Like, what do I do? All my friends are going to be different. Like, we're all going to mature. And so I decided that I was going to like interview people. So the last day of eighth grade was like a field trip to Oaks Park. And I grabbed like my dad's little camcorder and tripod. And I interviewed like some of my classmates, just kind of asking them like, what was your favorite eighth grade memory? What do you want to do in the future? And then I interviewed my teachers as well. And even though I didn't know what I was doing, I'm glad that I like went through that. But then after that, once I was uh, like 15, I started um, this program called Pow Girls, which is an intro to filmmaking camp dedicated to girls and non-binary youth. And that experience, I think, is what really like made me blossom into this film world. One of my first interactions with Metro East was through the Pow Girls camp. Um, I think I did that maybe for twice, like for two years. So I was in high school and uh, during my time in high school, I also decided to enroll in the Center for Advanced Learning, which is Cal, and they have a digital media program there. So I was able to learn more about how to use cameras and just different types of uh, like visual art, like graphic design, photography, videography, et cetera. And then I went to PSU and I majored in film. So yeah, I've kind of had like this long history with this creative path that I'm on because I kind of knew what I wanted to do when I was in eighth grade. I was like, I want to make videos. I want to make short films. And then I sort of just pursued that. And it eventually evolved evolved into like my work that I do here at Metro and also just uh, sort of like cementing myself within the local film scene. Because when I uh, did Pow Girls, I uh, realized how much of a film community there was in Portland, which I wasn't really aware of before. I kind of always thought that I'd have to go to Hollywood to make it big as a director or whatever. But that exposure to the local film scene really motivated me to start uh, just like to start working, I guess, start making projects. Yeah. Well, tell me more about the the film scene here in Portland and a little wider to East County. Like what types of projects are you able to work on? What opportunities have you had access to? And maybe you could share with some of our listeners, like what opportunities they might have access to. Yeah. Um, There's definitely like, I'm lucky that I was able to go to like, college and pursue a higher education uh and like uh major in film I think that was definitely uh really important for me in terms of like networking with other people my age like my my peers but beyond uh that like educational setting I also participated in this program called Oregon Media Pathways and so that's how um, I got familiar with Maria Moreno, who's who I interviewed on the pod. Um, <laughs> so uh, that was uh, what I the work that I did there was um, it was basically like a they offered a PA boot camp, just like a day long course. And basically they teach you the fundamentals of what it is to be a PA on set. Um, and they also I'm pretty sure they like paid us to be there. So it was a thing that like a program that they were starting in order to help people who are ma- like maybe at the margins within the film industry and sort of incentivizing people to come and take this course so then they can later later be on basically like a list of PAs that are available and ready to work. 
Mm -hmm. So I think that was a really great program and that's still ongoing. Um, So that's an opportunity that people are able to look into if they fit the requirements. Um, Because it is geared specifically towards marginalized people. Um, I'm trying to think. I mean, for youth, POW Girls is still ongoing too. Um, I think that's a really great opportunity. They provide scholarships. That's how I was able to attend. Um, I got my, both of the times was through the scholarships that they had. And I think in general, just like I've been able to like slowly make relationships with people through those programs that I've been in. So like with Oregon Media Pathways, I've like been able to work on uh, different sets. So Something else that I'm passionate about is music videos. I was able to work on a music video for a band called Ila Bamba, which is a band that I love. And I was a, a art department PA. And I met a lot of cool people there who I've like kept in touch with or I've seen uh, just throughout the city at like different networking events. So yeah, I try to like stay in touch with like different film programs like Oregon Media Pathways. Um, I just like follow a lot of film accounts on Instagram, honestly. That's like my go-to thing. Like I just followed Gearhead Grip on Instagram and they like are starting to host events. Is that Um, here in Portland? It's in Portland, yeah. Okay. It's like a rental house in Portland. Nice. Um, Desert Island Studios is another like studio space in Portland that definitely does a lot of good work and they have their own kind of like crew of people that consistently work in and out of there. Obviously, Metro East Community Media is a great spot uh, to stay in touch with. Yeah, and I think just like following creatives that I admire has also helped me a lot to not only like follow their work, but also like see if they're posting about any events that are happening that I can, you know, be a part of. So you mentioned PA, production assistant training, My question for you is certain people feel drawn to certain roles. Do you pursue certain positions when you're working on projects? What does that look like for you? Yeah, um, I am uh, about to attend a a camera operating like slash assistant camera. It's basically like a training that's happening. I believe it is through Oregon Media Pathways. Um, So yeah, right now I'm really interested in like getting into the world of Uh, cinematography and camera operating in general I think that's what I found myself more drawn to throughout my time as a creative but I think when it comes to like getting gigs I've found myself just like sticking to PA stuff because I kind of want to get a feel of everything that there is to do on a set but yeah I'm still trying to like build up towards doing more like AC gigs or anything camera related but yeah I think I just really like operating the camera I think it's really cool to be able to use this piece of technology to like capture a story and even just kind of thinking about it as like I don't know I like what I'm seeing is what the camera is seeing so that sort of like relationship between a person and a machine like whoever's operating the camera has that control you know, you got to take control of the media. So Metro that, East slogan. <laughs> so that's, yeah, that's what I like about camera operating. It feels like you have a lot of, um, yeah, you just have a lot of control in that position sometimes. And it feels really empowering to me. Is there a favorite project that you've worked on or specifically maybe one that you've you've been behind the camera for? Um, yeah. So as of recent, I shot a music video with the day, the DeJour day. McKinley. And we had on the pod. Yeah, we had Day on the pod, which I'm really glad that he was able to come on and like talk more about his creative process. Um, so it was a music video for one of Day's songs called Halloween. And um, we shot that with a small team. So it was me, Day, Angela, who we've kind of mentioned before on the show. And she was she's in the BIPOC contractor program yeah, we have here. She, yeah. yeah, she's on the BIPOC contractor program that I was also a part of and Day is also a part of. So that's kind of how we got connected, the three of us. Um, we also had some other people, some of Day's friends that were kind of coming in and out throughout uh, the shoot. But that was, a, that was a gig that I was able to primarily 
do camera operating. And it was just a lot of fun. Just being able to work with your friends, I think, is such a privilege because, you know, going on independent sets or like bigger film sets, um, you don't always know who's going to be there. You don't always know the people. And that's kind of like, you know, a challenge of filmmaking is that it requires a lot of networking and like uh, building relationships and like interpersonal skills like that. But when you're able to work with your friends, it makes things so much easier because you're already comfortable with the people. You already know them and you already like hopefully you kind of have um, like similar creative mindsets. And so I think that helps a lot when uh, when I was working on that project with them uh, because we were all sort of like in the mindset that we're doing this for ourselves. Like, you know, we're not getting paid to do this work. We're just doing it because we care and we are all passionate about making videos and films so that was a really cool gig because um yeah I was able to work with them I was able to use uh the black magic camera we have here black magic ursa I think so or so many it's, 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 maybe hopefully it's probably it. that right yeah <laughs> um that was fun it made me feel like I was yeah like I was in control like I was doing something making decisions or just kind of helping out with whatever shot list that they already had so I, yeah, I just really appreciate being in that role. Mm -hmm. Aside from like music videos or maybe, I mean, maybe it's related to music videos, but is there a type of story like content wise that you like to work on? Mm. Like issues you care about, topics? Yeah. Yeah. That's what I'm trying to get at. And, uh, yeah, totally. I think it's, that's such an interesting question because I, I'm sort of like aware of the, the topics and the concepts and style that I like and I want to gravitate towards, but I haven't necessarily made that kind of stuff yet. I have so much that I know I want to do, but I just like, I have to wait for the right time. I don't know. I feel like that's, as a creative, that can be a big struggle, like having all these ideas, all these plans, all these things that I care about, but it's just it's not the right time. Like I, you know, making films, making videos, you have to like really plan it out and, um, be organized. So, uh, just kind of thinking about like films that I like, um, like the, have you seen the watermelon woman by Cheryl Denye? Did you tell me about that one? I don't know. Maybe. Is it animated? <laughs> no, it's not animated. <laughs> Never mind. Nope. <laughs> so it's a film that's kind of like, um, it's kind of like a mockumentary. Ooh. So it's about uh, this character named Cheryl and the director slash writer is Cheryl. So it's like basically herself and she's trying to find the history of um, she's like watching this old movies from like the 40s or something like a black and white film. Cheryl is looking for who the actress is behind the Mammy character in this film that she's obsessed with. And so she sort of like finds the history of this woman and like finds out that she was like a lesbian actress and that there's like all this history behind who she was as a person and like the characters that she played and she's trying to basically find her like Cheryl within this other character so I think the point I'm trying to get at is that <laughs> I really value uh projects where like you can see the creator mm. in the project so whether it's like you know, a self-documentary or a self-mockumentary as it would be in The Watermelon Woman or uh, just kind of like, um, I don't know. I just really value when like people write stories about themselves or like sh show things about their life that are maybe like more vulnerable, like, you know, talking about um, like for myself, it would be like maybe talking about my experience as a first generation mexican-american or you know talking about like having a queer identity i think stuff like that is things that i value a lot um so that yeah that, i guess that's like the type of content that i like in addition to just kind of like uh more visually driven stuff like music videos yeah i feel like oh you said so much there that i could like touch on one is relating back to your I don't know if you use the word man in the machine, but like that's how I'm going to there's there's oh, a book yeah, on yeah. this bookshelf that's about 
or it's oh it's it's right there it's the the machine in the garden or something but mm. but thinking about the camera we sometimes can think that the camera is objective like oh the camera's just recording the world we live in but the mm. camera always comes at a fixed point someone is behind the camera running the camera or someone placed the cameras in a certain spot where you're going to capture a certain part of an image so it's like yeah. in content that then reveals the creator it's like it just to me it feels right because it, it's just acknowledging the fact that camera isn't objective there there is someone behind the lens shaping the story so i think that sort of stuff is super cool so the watermelon mm -hmm. woman is that a feature yeah it okay. is yeah 1996 is it, is it in black and white um no it's not in black and i white. was like imagining it in black and white well the movie that is like part of the story is in black and white. It's like an old movie. See, spot on, <laughs> sort of. <laughs> yeah, but I think yeah, the, like I think self-reflexive is the word that I was trying to yeah to get at in that whole explanation. But thinking about the like interviews that I shot in eighth grade, like that was me trying to like come to terms with the fact that I was maturing. Maybe that's part of the reason why I value like self-reflexive work is because it's very telling of like who you are during that time, during that phase, during that age, and like the environment around you. Also part of the reason why I value this uh, art form so much is because it's kind of like an archival process. And I think you've touched a little bit on that before in our classes. So that's something that I also really value about uh, like audiovisual art is that it's kind of like a little time capsule in itself. And it's something that you can look back on and still enjoy and also kind of think about what was happening outside of the project. Like what sort of environmental factors were contributing to this specific project. Yeah. In a way. I really resonate with that. I think um, film art for so many people, it's a way of making meaning out of a very complicated world. And especially like the things that we witness like outside of us, but even within ourselves, like figuring out who we are, um, intersecting identities and things like that. Another thing that you mentioned a little bit ago was your your background, like being a first generation American, um, mm -hmm. your parents coming from Mexico. Now that you're a year in at Metro East, mm -hmm. you've been working as an educator for a while and also just involved in the filmmaking community for, for years since eighth grade. How did your parents... <laughs> How they react to that? And how did you, do you navigate maybe any pressures coming from an immigrant background? Yeah, um, I'm really lucky that my parents have like supported me in this journey. Um, I think part of the reason why, or part of the reason why I assume that they have supported me in this journey is that like, because we live in the United States, we have a lot of freedom to do what we want in terms of like career options. No one in my family has ever like done anything creative like this like or yeah yeah not that I can think of no one in my family or like my past my ancestors whatever the people before me um have done any creative work like this so I think part of the reason why my parents have been supportive is because like maybe they know that I'm stepping into new territory and that it's good to to explore new things because I have the privilege of being here and I might as well, you know, I think I've known what I've wanted to do for a while and they have also kind of known that as well. So it's been like, they've seen me make the steps and like work hard towards it. So yeah, I think that's part of the reason why uh, they support me. That's good. <laughs> well, and like you said, I think you're, your career journey, your creative pursuits that's always going to continue to evolve is kind of a reflection of who we are and the world that we're in. And I'm excited to to be part of that journey. I know we didn't get to talk about it too much, but Jasmine and I have a lot of fun. We have a lot of fun. We work <laughs> we hard. We play hard, as they say. Um, <laughs> so congratulations on your, your one year at Metro East. Thank you. I know we're all lucky to have you as part of the team. And before I wrap things up, how can we find you online? Where can we find your work? Where can our listeners, viewers connect with you? Honestly, I try not to have like too much of an online presence. Just like follow Metro East. I'm, I will be on Metro East socials at some point to see the work that I do here specifically. 
Um, and in terms of like personal stuff, I'm, I'm on Instagram at Lava Pools. I'm private, but maybe if you seem cool, <laughs> we can, we can follow each other. Um, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. That sounds good. Um, any last thing that you want to share? Um, just that it's really cool to be here reflecting on this whole year of my career has been really, um, I guess really humbling because I, um, I don't know, or maybe humbling is not the word. It's just, I feel really grateful for this past year because, um, you know, being able to get this job has really helped me evolve as a creative and also as like an educator, which I never saw myself doing before. And so being an educator has helped me in my creative process. And I feel like those two things work hand in hand really well. And I'm really glad to, you know, interact with you and all of the people here in our cohort and mm -hmm. all of staff at Metro. So yeah, it's been a really good year. And here's to many more. Yes. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks, Jasmine, for joining me uh, again. I'm Anna Michelle. This is the Producers Corner podcast, where we have a blast producing episodes, interviewing people in the community, beyond the community, pretty much anyone in the Portland, outer East County area, working on cool content and specifically cool content that's doing good things for the world. All of our episodes are produced by an educational cohort. They get hands-on production experience, learning how to use our cameras, set up the equipment. So we hope you'll join us on future episodes of the podcast, or if maybe this is the first episode you've tuned into, you can check out some of our last ones. You'll get a little more Jasmine content in our first episode where um, Jasmine and I each host different episodes as well as our colleague Seth. And so you can learn more about all three of us in our first episode. Um, and see Jasmine, Jasmine does some interviews in Spanish, so you could check those out too. <laughs> yeah, so check out our past episodes. If you like this podcast, uh, give us a like, review, comment, just share it, amplify it with your networks. We'd love to get more eyes on the awesome people that we have on the show. And thanks for watching. If you wanna know more, metrees.org. That's the place to go. All right. Bye. Bye. <laughs>